My name is Barry Thomas. I'm the senior pastor of West Bay Bethel Community Church. And I just want to say welcome. It's good to have you with us. Um, I pray that today would be a time you really enjoy um, sharing with us. But more than that, it would be a time where you would really would encounter the Lord Jesus Christ. And yeah, your relationship with him would become something far greater and far more than you ever experienced or have ever realized. And so blessings. Great to have you with us. Good morning, everybody. Missing you guys like crazy. One thing I've realized about myself with this lockdown, like I didn't know it before, is that I really, really need people. I love my boys very much, but I need people around me. Um, just a quick note from me, just to say that um, I, I'm, I'm really thankful to the Lord for the fact that he gives us praise. Because praise and worship and and singing songs to him and reminding ourselves of who he is especially in a time like this helps us get our perspective right helps us get our minds right and helps us get our hearts right as well and um so i i found myself when i've i've been spending time with him um throughout this lockdown this one song has been repeating itself over and over in my heart and in my mind and i've been singing it quite a bit to him i think he might be a little bit irritated with me already with it but um, it is something that is 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 very close to my heart, and um, and so just to to help us get the perspective of of what is God doing here, how can we learn from it, and how can we remember that that He knows best and He is in control, no matter what's going on right now. And the song that I've been singing to him and, and has been going over in my mind, some of you might not know it, it's an older song, some of you might remember it, um, but it goes something to the tune of, Show me your ways, that I may walk with you. Show me your ways, I put my trust in you. The cry of my heart is to know you more, to live with a touch of your hand, stronger each day. Lord, show me your way. Show me your way. that i may walk with you show me your way i put my trust in you the cry of my heart is to know you more to live with a touch of your hand stronger each day show me your way and so that's my prayer for me and for you as we continue lockdown here in south africa bless you all and may you have a wonderful wonderful day well good morning everybody um, isn't it amazing that we can use modern technology like this just to still meet together and so we pray that wherever you are that you you are still safe that you're still doing well and thank you so much for for joining us as we continue doing what we're doing and so this morning before we continue i think it only fitting that we open up in a word of prayer so let's pray together dear heavenly father we thank you for your amazing love we thank you for how you've kept us safe lord we thank you for for you are the god that is still in control but Lord, most of all, we thank you how you are the God that still speaks to us today. And Lord, we pray that as we dive into your scriptures, into your word, Lord, may you speak with us. Lord, send your spirit just to be with us wherever we are. May we get a fresh, deep understanding of what you are saying to us through the scriptures. And so Lord, we pray for that right now. In Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. So if you, you've just joined with us this morning, thank you so much and welcome. Um, just so you know, we have just recently, I say recently, last week, we started a series on 1 Timothy. 
And Barry shared with us last week, and if you want to watch that, feel free to go back. It's on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to find it there. Um, and remember, Barry shared with us about how 1 Timothy is a very practical book, a book that um, kind of gives us a lot of how to run the church, sort of DIY for church running if I can put it like that. DIY, how to run the church. But it's also a book that's full of lots of doctrine. And so last week, Barry looked very specifically at how false doctrine has been creeping into the church. And so today, this morning, I have the privilege just to continue as we journey through 1 Timothy. And so I'm going to ask one of our young adults, Trey, just to do the reading for us this morning. If you want to turn so long, it's 1 Timothy 1, verse 11 to 20. Thanks, Trey. You can take it away. Hey, everyone. Um, I trust you're all doing well in this time. Um, I'll just be doing the scripture reading, which we'll find in 1 Timothy chapter 1, from verse 12 to 20. It reads as follows. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people, but God had mercy on me, because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Jesus Christ. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Um, verse 18. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. Based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier, May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear, for some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Hymenus and Alexander are two examples. I threw them out and handed them over to Satan so they might learn not to blaspheme God. Amen. Thank you for doing the reading for us this morning, Trey. I'm greatly appreciated. And so this morning, we, as we continue our journey through the book of 1 Timothy and continue in Timothy chapter 1, um, we get to a point now in the letter where Paul almost seems to shift, going from speaking about false doctrines to be getting very, very personal. And so in this personal outpouring, we actually see Paul in verse 19 telling Timothy to hold on. And that's what I've entitled this message this morning, Holding On. And before we get any further, you may be wondering why Paul is telling Timothy about holding on. And I think to get a better understanding of where Paul himself was going and what he was sharing with Timothy, we need to know a bit of Paul's background. And so to get that, we're going to look in Scripture, and we look at Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, and we get to see a resume of what Paul's life was like before he became a Christian. We get to see what Paul was doing in the time leading up to that amazing encounter that he had with Christ. So let's turn together to Acts chapter 8. I'm going to read quickly from verse 1. Saul was one of the witnesses and had agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. So if you remember, Paul was known as Saul before he gave his life to the Lord. And here we see Stephen who was stoned and Paul agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Let's just read quickly to verse 3. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Here we see how Paul almost made it his mission in this part of his life, in this time of his life, to go around destroying the church. And the last piece of scripture that I want to pick up this morning can be found in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priests. He requested letters to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them back, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. And here we definitely see Paul was a man who had a past. Paul was a man that before he had this radical encounter with Jesus, was 
the best way we can kind of put it is not a very nice guy to be around. If you were a believer or in those times known as a follower of the way and you saw Saul coming along, you kind of knew, hey, things aren't looking that good. However, we get to this point now where Saul has had this amazing encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and he's already for a while been pouring into the life of young Timothy. And we see Saul here, sorry, Paul here, as a much older, wiser person. And after pouring into Timothy, equipping his life for ministry, he writes his first letter of encouragement to young Timothy. This letter of advice that he gives to Timothy. And remember, as I said earlier in the introduction last week, Barry showed us how he starts off telling Timothy about how false doctrine is creeping in and to guard himself from that. And then he gets to this point where he almost says to young Timothy, well done, hold firm. And I don't know about you, but to receive letters like this, even nowadays, are really, really encouraging. You know what it's like when you've done really, you've been trying really hard to do something, and somebody that you respect either sends you a WhatsApp or sends you a message, or maybe an email, and says, well done, I'm really proud of the way you did that. It kind of does something for you. And this letter of encouragement would have been hugely encouraging to Timothy. I know if I had got a letter from somebody like Paul, this whole letter like this, I would be hugely encouraged by that. See, I believe Timothy must have been spurred on to continue doing what he was doing after he got this letter from Paul, somebody who was a spiritual father, somebody that was a spiritual role model. But when we read Paul's letters, and 1 Timothy is by no exception here, we see Paul often just stop and all of a sudden break into just praise and worship. He'll just start worshipping God and and getting very spontaneous in doing that. Well, Paul's thankfulness and maybe very spontaneous as he's doing it, I believe there's a realisation that he comes to in his writings of God's mercy against his background that we've just looked at. Or simply put, Paul could never forget what he had done, but he could also never forget what God had done for him. You see, there's this realization of God's mercy, this outpouring of God's mercy upon his love compared to what he had done. Paul, who was once a blasphemer, Paul, who was once a violent man, a man who would kill people, now rejoices in the fact that God chose him. Now think about that. Paul persecuted the church, persecuted followers of the way in his ignorance and unbelief and how God has poured his mercy out upon him. Now, there's something here that we we kind of need to remember before we go any further. That that Paul is not saying that all who act in ignorance, that all who act in unbelief, will automatically receive mercy. Remember, God is a just God. And when we look at it, nobody is truly ignorant of right and wrong. Nobody is completely ignorant of God. All we've got to do is look around us and see the created world. Oh, when I look at the sunset or the sunrise, I see God's hand in that. Where when I've had the privilege, when friends have had a young baby and I get to hold that baby for the first time, and you look down and, and it holds onto your finger, I see God's hand in all of that. You see, Paul came to the point in his life when he had that encounter on the road that he realized that he needed to repent and turn from his ways. He needed to repent of his sins and turn to Christ. And, and we get to that point as well. You see, it's because of this ignorance and this unbelief that Paul first had that he looks back now and he's never failed to be amazed at the love that God has poured out upon his life. And not just poured, abundantly poured, overwhelmed him in that love. And he's never stopped thanking God for that. What an amazing place to be in life when you see what God has done for you and this love that he's poured out for you. And you never stop thanking him for that. You see, Paul was a man that has life filled with faith. And faith, no matter what he was facing. If we look at Paul, Paul was somebody who knew what it meant to have a life full of trials. We see a man that was imprisoned, a man that was shipwrecked, a man that was beaten, a man that was mocked. Here's Paul knew what it was to have trials. You see, when we look at Paul's life, his life was only filled with his faith. It was because of that faith, that overwhelming faith that he had, that his life was also filled with his love for Christ. 
and his love for God's overwhelming love. This love and adoration for Christ that he could simply not stop speaking about. I get this very distinct impression that the poor realized Christ changed his life and that God was not holding on to his past but rather looking forward and saying, who is Paul in Christ? And we see Paul even get to the point here where he, Paul knows what the gospel is. And he gives us a quick highlighted version of the gospel in verse 15, a one-liner. And he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let me say that again. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You see, we see Paul continuing here afterwards to even say that he is the worst of worst sinners. Saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save people just like me and just like you and just like Paul. But then Paul gets to the point where he says, look at me, I was the worst of worst sinners. Paul's kind of saying, we think of somebody that we would never want to hang around with. Paul himself was worse than that. And in doing some research on this, I found a lot of commentators get to the point where they think that Paul's being very overdramatic in what he is saying here. But they go, oh, Paul's just like trying to prove a point. But I don't think he, he's being overdramatic when he refers to himself as the worst of worst sinners. We just look at his background and see what he's done. We look at his background and see how he's persecuted the church. But you see, Paul's appreciation of the gospel, Paul's appreciation of the fact that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners was deepened by the knowledge of his background. You see, we know that those who are the most conscious of their previous op opposition to God used to become the most vocal in the understanding of God's unlimited patience. Such people become exhibits of what God can actually do in their lives. And, and we look at the world that we live in, the world that we live in is kind of influenced after the media. And we see movies. And we see where there's so many Christian-themed movies out there where we often see here's this guy that's absolutely failing in life. Here's this guy that, that has hit rock bottom. Here's this guy that is on his way to, to death almost, if we can put it that way. And he gets to know Jesus and he sees Jesus and he has this amazing encounter. And he turns his life around and, and he gets to the point where he, he just starts sharing his faith with people. And we're seeing people saved and people doing amazing things because of what is going on in this person's life. What is the first thing that we often think? Oh, that's just the movies. That can't happen in real life. Maybe we see somebody who, who's come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and we see them turn their life around. Somebody that we would never, ever want to spend any time with. And they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And, and they're doing amazing things and they're telling people. What do we normally say about them? Or what do we sometimes say about them? Maybe we refer to them as zealots. But have we ever referred to somebody as charismatic? And that got me thinking. I don't know about you, but if I get to the point where, where I think charismatic is being bad... I think we've kind of lost the point. We, have, we, we need to get to the point realizing that, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save me and to save you. That excites me. And I want people to know about that. I want people to know about this new amazing relationship that I have. And if that terms me as a charismatic, well, so be it. Then I'm a charismatic. I'm a charismatic because I know Christ loves me. And I want to live that out every single day, however I can. You see, Paul realized that the gospel is transformative. The gospel changes lives. And that's what made him have this passion. That's what made him have the zeal that he is passing on to young Timothy here. And so if you've been in church in the last couple of weeks, you would have seen that there was a, a banner up that had the word gospel on it. And it was a way that we shared with our, our young guys, with our youth, to share the gospel, to share their faith. And it uses gospel as an acronym. And I wanted to share that with us this morning, just so that you can see the gospel is transformative. And so if we look at those six words, God our sins, paying everyone life. And so let's look them down and break them down quickly. The first one, God. God created us to be with him. Isn't that amazing? 
that God who created the universe, that spoke the world and everything into existence, created us to have a relationship with Him. But unfortunately, we get to the next one, our. Our sins separated us from God. And then sins. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. No matter how hard we try, sins can simply not be removed by good deeds. Why? Somebody needed to pay the price. And that brings us to our next word, paying. Paying the price. Jesus died and rose again. And then who's this for? Everyone. Everyone who believes in Him, in Christ alone, has eternal life. Everybody who believes in Jesus alone has eternal life. And obviously this life, this life with Jesus, starts now and lasts forever. So this is just one way of sharing the gospel, but you get a picture of how transformative the gospel is, and hopefully that gets you excited. You see, Paul got that the gospel was life-changing. And no matter what his past looked like, there was this future waiting for him. Despite all that he had gone through and all that he had caused suffering in others, there was this time that was coming for him. And when we look at Paul in this writing of 1 Timothy, it's almost like he's writing his memoirs. He's coming to sort of the end of his life. He's realizing that his life was starting to wind down. And that may not be a very pleasant thing to think about, considering where we are currently as a country, in the middle of our lockdown, in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis that we find ourselves in. But here we take Paul, who's gone through suffering, gone through hardships, and the last thing that he's thinking or wanting to do is to leave Timothy with some advice. You see, Paul gets to the point where he wanted to encourage young Timothy. But more than that, he wanted to, to give him the advice to, to stand firm, to hold fast, to hold on to his faith. And we see now, as we come to verse 18, that Paul gets very personal here with Timothy. Timothy. And, and I know for a lot of us, maybe we don't like it when things start getting personal, but Paul gets very personal with Timothy. And Paul uses the word here on some instructions. And when we look at that word, there's the sense of urgency in that word, the sense of you've got to do this. It's almost the sense of this militaristic sort of viewpoint that you have to do this. You see, what is this that Paul's referring to? Paul's obviously referring to the prophecies that have been spoken over young Timothy. And because of these prophecies, Paul was obviously certain that Timothy had been chosen by God to be a leader, um, to be a leader in the church. Now, Paul is obviously reminding Timothy of these prophecies, but why? I think there's two main reasons we need to look at here. Firstly, Paul was encouraging Timothy, um, and I don't know about you, but it's very encouraging when we get sort of somebody saying well done as I mentioned a little bit earlier so, so playing rugby when, when you do something like well or you've done you've scrummed really well and your coach looks and says well done I'm proud of you that kind of stirs you on to, to kind of keep pushing yourself and doing better um, when you follow a fundu who, who's somebody that you look up to and somebody that you respect in a certain field and they just say to you well done I'm proud of you for doing it I'm proud of the way you did it I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, as a guy, that when my dad looks at me and says, well done, I'm proud of you, it kind of encourages me, it eggs me on to, to continue pushing, to continue doing well, to continue holding on to what I'm doing. And when we see Paul here writing to Timothy, not sort of just as somebody that, oh, well done, good for you, you did really, really well, but he's writing to Timothy as somebody that he loves, somebody that he cares really deeply for. He doesn't see Timothy as just an acquaintance or some partner in ministry. He sees Timothy as a son. But more than that, he sees Timothy as somebody that he loves and cares for deeply. You see, Paul knew that Timothy, being a young pastor, would have to face many battles. But if Timothy remembered that it was God that appointed him, and Paul kept encouraging him about that, that God chose him, Timothy would be able to hold on and to fight the fight and to lead well. Secondly, by Timothy being reminded of these prophecies, not only will he be able to fight the good fights, um, he'll be able to hold on firm when life gets tough. Um, and notice what I said there, when life gets tough. 
It's not if life is going to get tough, or maybe life will get tough, but rather when life gets tough. So here's Paul urging Timothy to hold on. And by extension, Paul urging us, hold on. When life gets tough, hold on. Never let go of our faith. And that's how we need to continue living our lives. By doing so and holding on to our faith, something else happens. We can keep a clear conscience. You see, faith and conscience always have to work hand in hand. Faith and conscience can never, ever be separated. Um, By doing so, by keeping our faith and our conscience hand in hand, we keep strong. You see, Paul urges Timothy to do this. And when we look at that thought that faith and conscience always go together, we see Timothy living out this life because Paul reminding him to do so. And we need to realize that if our faith is not genuine, we will lose our clear conscience. And at the same time, if we don't repent of our sins, we will be turned away from true faith and towards those false doctrines that Barry spoke about last week. You see, our faith and our actions and our behavior must always agree. Our faith and our behavior must always agree. You see, Paul even gives Timothy an example of two men there that have fallen away from their faith. Using the word shipwrecked, think about that, that they had been shipwrecked. Their faith had been shipwrecked, never to be almost restored again, that he had thrown or handed them over to Satan. I would hate for somebody to refer to me like that, that that my faith was shipwrecked because I simply didn't hold on. So in closing, I want to leave us with a thought. You see, a good and clear conscience is essential for every Christian. For every believer, we need to have a good and clear conscience. But then we need to start asking ourselves, why do our spiritual lives become dry? And sometimes dry really quickly. Why do we lose our zeal, our zest for the Lord, this passion that we have for God? Why does our love towards God easily grow cold? And when we think about it, the reason is always the same. Namely, our conscience has become unclean because of some sin. Something has separated us from God. Something has separated us from God, so our conscience has become unclean. If we have sinned and not repented, we we lose the desire, we lose the power to love and to serve the Lord because we try and do it in our own strength. And so when we get to that point where we realize that our faith has been shipwrecked, we need to start realizing that we haven't held on to our faith in the difficult times. And so how do we do this? How do we hold on to our faith in the difficult times? Well, if we look at what Paul did for young Timothy here, he reminded him. But furthermore, we look at the relationship that Paul and Timothy had. Timothy, as a younger man, had an older man pouring into his life. And so, who's pouring into your life? And furthermore, whose life are you pouring into? Whose life are you encouraging? Who are you encouraging to hold on to their faith when life gets difficult? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray and thank you that you don't cause us to do this by ourselves. That we call to be in relationship with you. We call to be in relationship with one another. And Lord, we pray, may we always be an encouragement to those around us. May we be an encouragement for those around us to hold firm to their faith. Lord, we thank you that through your strength, Lord, no matter what the storm is, our anchor can hold because our anchor is you. And we thank you for that. And God, we just pray that you would help us. If there's any area in our life, no matter who we are, no matter how long we've known you, that is causing us not to have the relationship that we need to have with you, that you would help us to get rid of it. And Lord, we know sometimes that is painful. Most of the time that is painful because it means a course correction. But Lord, we pray right now, help us in this time. But Lord, most of all, we also need to say thank you. Thank you for keeping us safe in this crisis that we find ourselves in. Lord, thank you for the love that you continue to pour down and lavish upon us. But Lord, most of all, we thank you that you will never leave us and you will never abandon us. In Christ's holy name, amen.